So good evening. My name is Ann Kinseth and I'm the Director of Education at the Meadows Museum. And I'm so thrilled that you've all um, chosen to join us tonight um, for, our, for our Zoom lecture. Um, so before we get started, I did want to take a moment to familiarize all of you with the platform we're using this evening, so Zoom. Um, so upon entering, uh, your microphone is on mute. I believe we actually made it so you cannot unmute yourself tonight. And that's simply so that we avoid picking up any background noise um, during the lecture. Um, you'll also notice that at the bottom of your screen, there are several icons, one of which is a chat. Um, it says chat. That's what we'll be using tonight to communicate with each other. Um, if you have a question that you would like to ask the speaker, we ask that you open your chat pan panel and uh, type your question there. We'll hold questions till the end of tonight's talk, and at that point, um, we'll answer as many questions as time allows. The other thing I want to make you all aware of is um, kind of the way that you can view um, yourself and others and the speaker. So in your top right corner, you have controls that allow you to change how many people you see. I recommend using the center um, bar, which is the speaker view. That will allow you to see both the PowerPoint and our speaker tonight. I also wanted to point out that we have um, Christopher Hamm from the Meadow School of the Arts joining us tonight. He's here to help us with technology. So if you um, use the chat function to ask question more about the technology, you will either get a response from myself and Kinseth, or you may get a response from Christopher Hamm. I also want to thank Sketches of Spain uh, for partnering on tonight's event, and I hope that some of you are currently enjoying a delicious meal, a uh, Spanish meal at home. So this lecture will last about 35 to 40 minutes, and we'll have another 10 minutes or so at the end for Q&A. So I'm pleased to introduce this evening's lecturer, Rebecca Quinn Teresi. She's a PhD candidate at John Hopkins University and a specialist in golden um, age Spanish painting and works on paper. Her dissertation entitled Images of the Immaculate Conception and the Rhetoric of Purity in Golden Age Spain deals with the multimedia explosion surrounding um, the controversy over the theology of the virgin sinless conception. Mer uh, Rebecca, uh, it's somewhat in the family here because she was the Meadowcrest Prado Predoctoral Fellow here at the Meadows Museum from 2015 to 2016. And prior to her time at the Meadows, she held fellowships at the Baltimore Museum of Art and the Department of Print and Drawing at the British Museum. More recently, she's been a fellow at the Edith O'Donnell Institute for Art History at UTD, where she led a graduate seminar on early modern portly collecting. So welcome, Rebecca Quinterisi. Thank you so much, Anne. And I'm just going to adjust my view so I don't have to stare at myself while I'm talking. Um, thank you everyone for joining. This is not my first time giving a lecture, but it is my first time Zooming on this side of the camera. So please bear with me if there are any technical difficulties. And thank you so much, Chris, uh, for being on hand in case we have any issues. So let's head to 1623 Madrid. I'm not sure if any of you are feeling like I am lately and wish you could take a trip somewhere other than your house or the grocery store. But if I could pick any place to go in a time machine, I think it might be Madrid in 1623. The six months between March and September of that year packed in more intrigue and drama than you can possibly imagine, but you won't have to imagine it because we're going to explore it together. Um, as a matter of fact, the action-packed quality of that six-month period is probably not all that dissimilar um, to the six months between March and September of 2020, but hopefully a lot less gloomy. So come along and we're going to begin our journey um, by taking a little trip to the meadows from our sofas. I hope all of you have been to the meadows before, but if you, if you haven't, here is your opportunity. So if we were to go to the meadows together, we would head up the stairs and into the permanent collection galleries, through the doors and to the room uh, where we have 17th century 
painting. Um, and we've got this beautifully installed wall here with three works by the 17th century Spanish artist Diego Velazquez. Um, the Meadows Museum is proud to boast three works by the artist that might seem modest if you don't know much about Velazquez, but if you do, you realize that that's a rather uh, big number of works given that Velazquez's lifetime output was so small compared to his contemporaries. Just over 100 or so works by his hand survive, and we can compare that to the output of Rubens, who made about 14 times as many pictures. Um, then again, Rubens had a very big workshop to help him. Um, but even if we compare Velazquez's output to that of a, uh, of a less wildly prolific artist like Rembrandt, for example, um, even Rembrandt produced at least three times as many works as Velazquez. But the works of Velazquez that do survive are magnificent. After all, this is the artist who painted Las Meninas. And if you ask most art historians, not even just biased Hispanists like myself, what the single most important painting of all time is, the majority would probably answer Las Meninas. And you can test this out later if you ever come across an art historian. Um, and Las Meninas, it's a painting about painting. Maybe it's the painting about painting. Part of the reason why Velazquez's output was so limited was that he was not only an artist and not only the chief artist at the court of the world's most powerful empire, but he was also a courtier. And that job came with a lot of duties. So he was busy doing all of his work for the king and sometimes he couldn't get around to finishing um, as many paintings as I'm sure he would have liked. Um, but it leaves us to wonder, how did he get his start? Well, returning to this lovely green wall at the meadows, um, it's perhaps with this very painting or one very much like it. The, you see the young Velazquez um, was aged about 24 by the time we get to 1623. And he had been painting things like this in Seville. I'm not sure, Chris, do we know why red uh, lines are appearing on my screen? Because I don't think that I'm making them. Um, well, everyone just pretend that they're not there. That's okay. Um, let's see. He was, uh, the young Velazquez in Seville was painting things like this. Um, and I want you to know that he was just 19 years old when he painted this picture. And let's take a minute to appreciate this teenaged artist's um, handling of all the different textures we find in this single picture. The way he used his brush to describe the crepey skin of this old woman and then her gossamer-like veil right next to it, the smooth, plump complexion of this young boy and the psychology of his ambiguous expression. Remember, he was a master portraitist. If we look at the still life at the bottom of the canvas, it's almost like he's showing off. He masters a variety of textures here. We've got brass, ceramic, uh, the skin of an onion, Elsewhere, we have dirt under the boy's nails, um, or even the transparency of the glass carafe here that he suggested with just a few well-placed flashes of white paint. This is an artist who has shown incredible promise from the time he gained his independence in his late teens all the way through to his early 20s. Like I said, he had been working in Seville, which was a very cosmopolitan place. It was the third largest city um, in Europe at the time. Uh, but he was ready to make a name for himself at court. And the stars seemed to align for him to do so. There was a job opening at court with the death of one of the court artists and a new regime. The 18 year old Philip IV had been king for just two years and had himself was changing things up. So Velazquez took this opportunity to come to Madrid and try and make his big break. Because he was from Seville, he had important connections at court through the king's favorite. And to make a long story short, he arrived, dashed off a quick portrait of his host in Madrid. And this portrait sadly is now lost. Um, this portrait with the paint still wet was taken by the son of a nobleman to the palace and quickly made its rounds, impressing everyone who saw it and most importantly, impressing the king. The king was so impressed in fact that he wanted one of his own. But you don't have to take my word for it. Um, Francisco Pacheco, who was Velazquez's teacher, father-in-law, and the most important art theorist of the Spanish Golden Age, recounts the story for us. And I've got the Spanish on the right, if anyone cares to read the original, but I will be reading the English, which is on the left. V 
Velazquez was ordered to make a portrait of the prince, but it seemed more convenient to make one of his majesty first, even though it could not be done quite so quickly given the great activity. In effect, it was made on 30th August 1623, our favorite year, to the liking of his majesty and of the princes and the Count Duke, who affirmed that the king had never been portrayed until now. That means any other portrait hadn't really portrayed the king. This was the first one. And the same was felt by all the gentlemen who saw it. So here we have the young Velazquez quickly making a portrait of the young Spanish king. And because of the rapidity we see Pacheco describing, it was most certainly a bust length portrait. And it made a huge splash at court, eventually earning him exclusive rights to paint the king. Out of all the surviving works by Velazquez, which is the most uh, likely candidate for this career defining portrait? Well, as it so happens, um, it is most certainly the one at the Meadows. And even if the Meadows picture is not this career making portrait, it must have been one very similar made at this exact same moment. So our, for our purposes, we're going to say yes, the Meadows picture is the very picture described by Pacheco that gets uh, Velazquez his big break. So what was it about this portrait that appealed so greatly to the young king that it earned Velazquez his coveted job? Well, for one, it was certainly radical in its approach. When we look at the portrait, particularly if we all pretend for a moment that we don't know the sitter's identity, nothing about this portrait tells us that we are looking at a king. Yes, uh, he's richly dressed. In fact, black fabric was often the costliest in the 17th century as the um, rich deep dye was very difficult to achieve to that level. If you can imagine trying to take natural dyes and taking velvet and, and chunking them in natural dyes that you make from things that you can find around the natural world and then think how to, to make it this perfect black, then you might be able to appreciate why black was so uh, costly. But he's also austerely dressed. His simple collar, and this is called a balona collar, is a distinct departure from the flamboyant ruffs of his father's reign. This, what we're looking at, is a portrait of a sober, serious monarch beginning a reign that he hoped would be defined by restraint, austerity, and reform. Even if we look at his full-length portraits from the same period, he's set in an ambiguous face with very little ornament. Um, we're looking at the portraits of a king setting about the business of administrating an empire. Let's compare this portrait, for example, um, to a portrait of Philip's father and predecessor, which is defined by this flamboyant ornamentation and very precise detail, or even compare it to one of Philip's contemporaries. This is King Louis XIII of France, father, of course, of the Sun King, um, who, by the way, is also Philip's uh, brother-in-law. And you'll see what I mean here, though, when I say that Velazquez's style of portraiture was quite radical. So again, here we have Velazquez painting the young king, making his big break at court where he would go on to continue uh, to clobber the competition, gain more and more accolades, and eventually become ennobled. But all of that's a story, of course, that we'll have to await another day. Um, but if we return to Pacheco's passage that we saw earlier that tells us this tale of his rise to fame, you'll see that I left out an interesting detail the first time. So again, he was ordered to make a portrait of the prince, but it seemed more convenient to make one of his majesty first, even though it could not be done quite so quickly given the great activity. In effect, it was made on 30th August, 1623 to the liking of his majesty and the princes and the Count Duke who affirmed that the king had never been portrayed until now. And it was the same was felt by all the gentlemen who saw it. While doing it, he also made a study of the Prince of Wales, which was valued at 100 escudos. Um, which you'll just have to take my word for it. It's a pretty good price. <laughs> um, so that is to say, while Velazquez was painting the Meadows portrait or one very like it, he also made a portrait of the Prince of Wales. What was Charles, Prince of Wales, doing in Spain in 1623? Hmm. No, not that Charles, Prince of Wales. And this is where the Zoom lecture really doesn't have the same effect. So I, I'm just speaking alone to my cat right now, but I hope that you're all laughing at my silly joke. Um, this is Charles, Prince of Wales in Spain in 2011 with the now retired King Juan Carlos, but we're looking at a different Charles, Prince of Wales. This one right here. Um, 
This is where we get to the gossip from 1623 Madrid. One of the most famous painters of all time, Diego Velazquez, got his start as a young man amidst one of the strangest episodes of the 17th century, what is known as the Spanish match. It went like this. Ever since Spain and England had agreed to peace almost 20 years before, um, in fact, it happened the same year that Philip was born. And you can see here a portrait of all of those who showed up for the signing of this really momentous peace treaty in 1604. Um, there had been talks of a match between the heir to the English throne and one of the Spanish princesses. The idea was that nothing cements peace better in early modern Europe than a dynastic alliance. Um, shared grandchildren will do that, even to the bitterest of enemies. There were lots of hopes riding on this match. Um, perhaps the highest hopes were those of the English Catholics. And we can see they were even um, running a PR campaign to try to make it happen. This is a pamphlet that English Catholics subsidized the year before the events that are um, of interest to us. And they feature an image of the imagined wedding between the English prince and the Spanish infanta. And of course, it's presided over by none other than Jesus Christ himself. Um, but there were also plenty of those who were against the idea of a Spanish match, especially in notoriously anti-Catholic England, where English Parliament was decidedly unfriendly to the idea. And the political climate just wouldn't support it. So as you can imagine, the back and forth of this careful diplomatic dance orchestrated by the resident ambassadors on both sides going along for years and years might become a little bit tiresome, especially for a romantic 20-something bridegroom ready for his bride. And here we can see uh, the bridegroom Charles and his prospective bride, the Infanta Ana Maria, uh, Ana Maria or Maria Ana, rather. Um, and this is another portrait, of course, by Velazquez. Um, impasse was not a very fun state of affairs for a young man of a romantic heart. Uh, then let's add some fuel to the fire. In the autumn of 1622, the Spanish ambassador sent a letter to London insinuating that everything for the match was a go. And we can read it together. I've um, credited this scholar here, Glenn Redworth, who, whose book I will mention at the end of the talk, but he is the one who found this document uh, first, languishing in an archive. And he uh, translated, you see it's a multilingual he, um, the author, the Spanish ambassador, apologizes for not writing in French because um, in diplomatic circles in early modern Europe, everyone was supposed to write in French. And he writes, my lord, my good friend, and then he uh, switches over to Spanish. And um, let's see what he writes in his own words. I omit a thousand things that I should like to tell you. I will only say that as far as we here are concerned, and he means we here in Madrid, the, de the decision has already been made and with very great enthusiasm that the Prince of Wales should mount saying, hmm, that's rather uh, colorful language, isn't it? All the others that tried must look somewhere else for their relief. Also, the wish here is that the matter should be dealt with post haste. Um, so here we have with this kind of encouragement um, coming out of Spain, the young Prince Charles, age 22, made the remarkably romantic and also remarkably foolhardy decision to take matters into his own hands and go and fetch his bride for himself. He was accompanied in his quixotic journey by the handsome and extremely dashing George Villiers, who was at first an earl and then later during this uh, road trip to Madrid, he was promoted as Duke of Buckingham. And he was then in his early 30s. And for the past decade, he had been the royal favorite of King James. Um, you might recognize the name King James from the King James Bible, same guy. Uh, James was Charles's father and had a notorious penchant for surrounding himself with handsome young men. Draw what conclusions you will from that. Um, but James was getting old and it's likely Buckingham saw this one-on-one -on -one road trip for lack of a better term with the young Charles as an investment in the future, a way to ingratiate himself with a boy who would likely all too soon become king. We have a portrait of the Duke, the dashing Duke locally here at the Kimball in the DFW area. But just to give you a taste of his personality, I couldn't resist 
uh, pulling up this very saucy marriage portrait that he had made of himself and his wife as Venus and Adonis, uh, if that, that gives you an idea of who we're dealing with. He also probably had good advice for the young Charles because his wife um, was in fact Catholic as well. And that brought its own drama earlier uh, in the six, around 1620. But so to return to our story, we've got Charles and Buckingham. We can call them Chuck and Buck if we really wanna let loose and have fun. Um, they set out from Buckingham's villa in Essex on February 18th, 1623. So we can look at this map and see their journey with the dotted line. They're setting out from the London area um, they're both disguised, they're, they're wearing false beards, and the prince even had an eye patch. They're tactical masterminds, aren't they? Uh, they were so far removed from what it meant to be an ordinary person that they didn't even bring small change for their journey and ended up paying enormous sums for everyday things. It would be like if you hopped in a, a taxi cab or an Uber and you only had a thousand dollar bills to pay your fare, the cabbie would be very happy about that, but you might also be giving away um, some part of your disguise. Uh, as you can imagine, their journey included many hijinks. They had to hide um, in a farmer's fields to evade a passing French ambassador on their way out. Um, before they had even left England, they had uh, gotten into some trouble and were arrested by the mayor of Canterbury. Uh, they had a stormy crossing across the channel in Paris. They wanted to um, check out the French court from the public galleries and they bought um, these massive wigs so that they could hide, hide their identities even better. Um, and I just think they had probably had a lot of fun. Um, and you can see, I think I would have a lot of fun on a road trip from London to Madrid, and I'm sure all of you would too. So just under a month later, they arrived in Madrid at 10 p.m. on Friday, March 7th, 1623. Uh, they knocked at 10 p.m. again at the door of the residence of the English ambassador, which actually still stands today. It's known as the House of the seven chimneys and you can see why this this structure here has seven chimneys you can count them at the top this portion over here uh, was an was a later addition so just pretend we're looking only at this uh, rectangular building here so they knock at the door um, and they gave their names to the answering servant as Thomas Smith and John Smith but once they're inside they revealed the truth and as you can imagine uh, the English ambassador was absolutely flabbergasted but he managed to collect himself and he immediately sent for his Spanish counterpart. In fact, the same guy that wrote that letter that said, come on and let's mount Spain. Um, and he had the wisdom to send the matter up the food chain to the Spanish king's royal favorite who in turn alerted the Spanish king. Uh, just to give you an idea of how crazy this is, I tried to think of a contemporary example, but it was sort of hard to do. I guess it would be like if the Pope just like showed up in Washington um, without anything organized um, to receive him. But, but to give you an idea of how crazy this is in 17th century terms, I wanted to show you this image that uh, is from a decade before, but it records how elaborate royal marriages were supposed to be. And this is the exchange of a Spanish and French princess, um, a Spanish princess and a French princess. Um, depicting the nuptials of actually of King Philip, our very King Philip, when he was but a boy of 10, as one does in the 17th century, you might have to get married when you're 10. Um, he got a French bride and an almost equally young French king, Louis XIII, got a Spanish bride. And they met at this river right on the border and using this elaborate system of barges and pulleys, the brides arrived exactly in the middle at exactly the same time so that no one was snubbed and equal courtesy was extended to both nations. And this is sort of an aside, but I couldn't help um, but mention it. But it's a fun historical fact. If you look behind the barge here at this little island, um, you'll see that this island still today marks a later peace that happened between France and Spain. They were always bickering and it's hard to keep track of when they were happy with each other and when they were unhappy with each other in the 17th century. Um, but as part of a later peace agreement, that little island, the island of the pheasants, changes hands every six months. So if you go there, although um, 
you're not really supposed to from everything I've read. Um, if you get on that island and fall asleep there on th that island in August or February, uh, you might wake up uh, the next day in a different country than the one you fell asleep in. Um, so let's go back to Charles showing up unannounced in Madrid. Um, the Spanish were taken by surprise, but they didn't want to be taken for fools. Nine days and a lot of scrambling later, they organized, uh, oh, and there's the island of the pheasants today, just so you can see from Google Earth. So nine days and a lot of scrambling later, they organized an official entry for Sunday the 26th of March. Um, as you can imagine, there was a lot of excitement about all of this and the, uh, the press, or at least the 17th century version of the press, went absolutely wild. They circulated accounts about the prince's journey across Europe, they translated them into every language you can think of, and they reprinted them over and over again. People just couldn't believe that he had done this and they couldn't get enough of the story. Um, and this particular engraving that we see here is from a German account of his entry into Madrid. Um, and you can see that because it's all in German. Um, so we know from various royal chronicles that that day of his royal entry, the prince ate lunch at the monastery of San Jerónimo. He was greeted by local civil authorities. Um, he met the king in the courtyard of the monastery, and then they both rode out on horses underneath a canopy surrounded by a massive retinue of Spanish nobles. And you can see them both there on their horses. Um, the Prince of Wales is marked here in German. I would venture to pronounce that, but my German is terrible, so I won't um, force that upon your poor ears. Um, so they arrived together under this canopy at the Alcazar Palace, and then the day ended in fireworks. But the fun didn't stop there. Soon after Charles and Buckingham had arrived, dozens of English nobles joined them and formed a real formal retinue. So what did they spend their time in England doing, you might wonder, between the time he arrived in March and then the time he left in September? Well, they had lots of parties um, or fiestas. They had tournaments, bullfights, processions, etc. The English impressions of Spain um, during this visit are very interesting to read. We know that they were impressed by some things, um, particularly they were impressed by the Spanish women, um, but they were also unimpressed by other things. They complained about lack of napkins um, at roadside inns when they were on their journey down. Um, they also complained that some of the windows didn't have glass, um, which I guess they were used to in England. Um, Yes, um, but this picture that we're looking at here by a kind of lesser known Spanish court artist uh, records one of the many fiestas and this one is from August 21st, which was towards the end of Charles months long stay in Madrid and it was a big day in the courtship process for Charles as it was actually the first time he was allowed to sit next to the Spanish princess. Um, of course, he sits next to her on the balcony of the Panaderia in the background, which if you've ever been to Madrid, you'll recognize that building. It's right in the Plaza Mayor. Um, but of course, the iron railing of the balconies did separate the two would-be lovers um, so that they didn't get too close. Um, but the five-month stay was not all parties. There were also many not so veiled attempts to get Charles to convert to Catholicism. Um, because you see the Spanish would never agree to the marriage without certain religious conditions being met. And that's what of course had stalled the negotiation process for so long. Um, Charles was a Protestant prince and the Habsburgs were the most Catholic of all the European dynasties. They tried to convert him by all sorts of means. They exposed him to processions of penitents, you know, like um, punishing themselves for their sins um, at Easter. As you can imagine, that would be a very persuasive way to convert a Protestant. Um, they also had him uh, hole up in rooms and put bishops in front of him to debate theology with him. And you can read these accounts and it's actually quite impressive that this young guy um, who's this silly in so many ways was actually able to hold his own during all of these really uh, delicate moments. Um, 
But as for his wooing mission, you might wonder, how did that uh, get on? Well, I can't say, I wish I could say that it got on well, but it didn't go so well. He was uh, really actually besotted with the princess. He had hardly been near her, but he really believed himself to be in love with the Spanish princess. And you know, he had to be, if he was going to get, uh, go with a false beard and an eye patch all the way uh, from London to Madrid. Um, the, the Spanish king's favorite described him, and this is not so flattering, but the, the favorite, the Spanish king's favorite was not really um, in favor of this match. He said that uh, Prince Charles gazed at the princess like a cat gazing at a mouse. Um, by May, though, um, Charles had been in Spain for two months and was never given the opportunity to speak to the Infanta alone. So this is a guy, as we've seen, who likes to take matters into his own hands. Um, but the notoriously rigid protocol at the Spanish court would never allow them to speak. Talk about social distancing, right? Um, so it so happened, though, that he heard through the grapevine that the princess loved to pick flowers um, with her ladies-in-waiting at the Casa de Campo Palace. So he contrived a way to get there while she was there. And of course, he's accompanied by a wingman. And he wanted to get there and speak to her alone. Uh, probably had some silly poems that he uh, planned to read to her about how lovely she was. I, I can only imagine it and cringe at the thought. Um, but when he got there, he realized that she was actually in a, a walled garden within this um, country palace. Undeterred as ever, he decided, I've already come this far, why not go a little bit farther? And he decided to climb the wall and just spring himself on her and see if that would that would um, do it for her. And as you can imagine, this um, infanta who had been so delicately nurtured and had hardly probably ever spoken to male males that were not uh, directly related to her was understandably terrified and she ran away shrieking and Charles had to go back to his uh, guest quarters with his tail between his legs and this that I've, I've put up here is actually not an illustration of his escapade but it's um, a woodcut from um, the Spanish popular work um, La Celestina which if you're a student of any kind of Spanish history you'll recognize that name and this um, work was actually very popular in England in translation and we know that Charles bought a copy during his time in Madrid um, but in the end his suit really didn't work out it went nowhere the Spanish side had made the religious preconditions for the match so crazy um, that there was no way that it could ever go forward. They really did expect him to convert to Catholicism, but I suppose to be fair to them, his grand gesture in showing up in Spain unannounced was so radical that they thought it surely meant he intended to convert, so who could really blame them for thinking that? Um, they also expected legislative protections for British Catholics, um, and this had been something that Spanish monarchs had kept close to their heart uh, for centuries, if you think about the fact that um, England broke with Rome because of a desired divorce with a Spanish princess, right? The Catherine of Aragon and Henry VIII, everyone knows that story. Um, and But legislative protection for English Catholics never would have survived uh, the political climate of 1623 English Parliament. So. Even though the match went ultimately nowhere, the visit to Spain actually did leave a lasting impression on Charles. Um, and it wasn't just that like every kid who's ever studied abroad ever, he came back with a weird facial hair. Um, he came back with this silly mustache, um, which I find quite funny. And this actually helps you date portraits of Prince Charles. If you look at a portrait of Charles and he looks young and he doesn't have a mustache, you know it's before 1623. If he has a mustache, it's right when he came back. And then the next year in 1624, when they eventually go to war with Spain, then he has a little bit of a goatee in addition to the mustache. Um, so I can't help but poking fun at poor Charles. Um, but in addition to all of this diplomatic and romantic activity while he was in Madrid, um, he spent quite a lot of time nurturing and developing a taste for art that would actually become a defining factor of his reign in England. Before he went to Spain, he already had a taste for art, but he really honed it once he was there in Spain. And he would go on to become one of the greatest collectors of all time. Um, and as his English retinue that came with him actually included several other aspiring collectors, 
So no picture in Spain was safe, and we see this confirmed in the period sources. Vicente Car Carducho, who's an art theorist, says that many of the pictures we have named were at great risk when the Prince of Wales was here. Um, and this is uh, because the Spanish uh, Royal Collection of Art, which was built up by the Habsburgs over several centuries, was the most impressive collection in all Europe. Uh, particularly strong was their collection of Venetian painting, especially works by Titian. And this still holds true if you visit the Prado today. Um, the Prado boasts perhaps the best collection of Titians. Um, and because of the way diplomacy works, um, when, you, when a visiting prince admires something, he's often gifted it. Um, and I, my, actually my grandma was like this. If you went over and said, oh, I like your scarf when you left, she would be trying to give it to you. Um, and this is what happened with uh, one of Titian's most iconic works known as the Pardo Venus, not to be confused with Prado, but Pardo. Um, and it was gifted to Charles in June straight from the Royal Collection. He was also gifted works by noble collectors, including several more by Titian, as well as works by Spanish painters, like um, anyone who's super familiar with Spanish art will recognize the name of Navarrete el Mudo, who was Philip II's favorite painter um, in Spain. And others he bought, he bought them from local collectors. We know, uh, for example, that he bought a work um, by Albrecht Dürer, um, we know that he bought these two paintings by Titian. We're hearing a lot about Titian, but he loved Titian and he bought these two on the open market. Um, he bought some works directly from artists um, and he also bought sculpture. He tried to acquire uh, two Leonardo sketchbooks, um, but this very famous Spanish collector who had them just would not let them go for any price. Um, but the bottom line here is that his pocketbook was much lighter and his luggage was much heavier at the end of his trip than it had been at the beginning. Um, and Lope de Vega, I'm sure whose name you all recognize, also confirmed this. He said, the prince with notable care searched out all of the best pictures that, he could, that could be found uh, for which he paid and valued at an excessive price. In a bold move, um, Charles even asked Philip if he could have Titian's Poesie series. And um, incidentally, all six of these pictures have been reunited in London for the first time. Um, and we're supposed to be up at the National Gallery this right as we speak from March to June of this year, but understandably that's been postponed. Um, but these were arguably the jewel of Philip's entire collection and would have been a handsome present for Charles indeed. Um, if we believe Carduccio, they even had these pictures crated up for shipment to London. And when the match fell through, they must have been very glad that they hadn't sent them yet. Um, our friend Buckingham also made uh, many purchases in Spain and he spent a fortune too. Um, he even arranged for shipment back to King James, his protector, friend, potentially his special friend. Um, he sent him back lots of marvelous things, including um, this famous elephant that they had to, they had to try to move it by night once it got to London because they didn't want throngs of people gathering. So they tried to secret it to St. James's Park, but of course they wrote that they couldn't really secret it even by night because it's sort of hard uh, to hide an elephant. Um, but this elephant cost the English crown an absolute fortune to upkeep. Um, it went through a gallon of wine a day in the winter months, which is kind of a strange thing for an elephant to like. Um, I don't think anyone would try that today. Um, but if we return to the political situation uh, and step away from the fabulous art that Charles and his friends were collecting in Spain, uh, by the end of the summer, Charles was, uh, for all intents and purposes, a hostage in a golden cage at the Spanish court. He showed up unannounced, but then all of a sudden he couldn't leave uh, without causing dire offense. It wasn't as easy to go as it was to come. Um, so to, just to get out of there, he ended up agreeing to all of those crazy and strict religious conditions, uh, I suppose with his fingers crossed behind his back, just so that he could leave. He ended up having to leave behind um, powers for an English representative to marry him to the Infanta by proxy, which was the way that marriages were typ typically conducted um, in the early modern European world, but he revoked them on the fly as he left and he didn't tell the Spanish. Um, apparently they didn't suspect because Philip was so touched at their parting that he even erected this monument 
um, to this heartfelt parting at the very spot where they bid each other farewell. And it's known as the Columna del Adios or the farewell column. And I couldn't help but include this Jonathan Brown quote, this monument to futility still stands and can be visited by anyone who enjoys a hike over rough terrain to a somewhat anticlimactic destination. <laughs> Um, but there you have it. Philip erected this monument to their parting. Um, and the earnestness of the Spanish side is also evinced by um, the Infanta who started taking daily English lessons um, to prepare herself to become Queen of England. Um, but poor Charles uh, left and he headed from the farewell column to Valladolid and then on to Santander on the north coast of Spain. Um, setting sail in 23 ships back home. And his was the very first ship we see with the big uh, flag and he and Buckingham, Buckingham were on that ship. Um, even though the match was a failure and war would soon break out between the two nations, Charles was profoundly impacted by his visit. He dressed like a Spaniard for a while. And we can see that in this portrait that he had uh, painted shortly after his return. Again, like I told you, the secret of the mustache is how we can tell. Um, and he's dressed in that dashing Spanish black with a simple uh, white collar. Um, but the inspiration he took from the vast and rich Spanish royal collection of art was even greater. A cornerstone of his reign, as I mentioned, would be collecting. And he would continue to have a soft spot for Titian, um, whose work he had grown so fond of during his time in Spain. In the just over two decades of his reign, he was able to acquire some of the choicest collections in Europe and amass an impressive collection of works by Titian, Correggio, Raphael, Mantegna, among many others. So what happened to our cast of interesting characters after 1623? Let's start with Buckingham, shall we? After the death of King James, just a couple of years after this, um, he had become so unpopular that he was assassinated outside a pub in Portsmouth. And we can still see the side of it today. I think that um, little plaque that we see there on the wall marks the assassination of Buckingham. Um, and it's now a hotel. Uh, what about Charles? Well, he went on to marry a Catholic bride, but a French one. Um, and Unfortunately for Charles, he was actually ultimately beheaded. Any student of English history will know that. Um, you can see here, this is my favorite portrait of Charles, but here's um, a woodcut that shows him on the chopping block. Uh, he was beheaded in the midst of the English Civil War in 1649. And it was after this that the Spanish got their true revenge. His enormous collection that he had amassed um, was auctioned off in the Commonwealth sale, also known as the sale of the century, and monarchs from across Europe, including, of course, the much older Philip IV, sent agents to discreetly snatch up as much of his collection as they could. Um, as for the Infanta, you might wonder what happened to her. Well, um, she was married off a few years later and became Queen of Hungary and later the Empress of Austria. And her daughter, Mariana, in true Habsburg fashion, would be sent back to Spain to marry, that's right, her uncle, Philip IV. After the death of his first wife um, and the death of his heir, he needed a new bride. And where did he look but to his niece? Um, so they would have two surviving children, the Infanta Margarita and Charles II, who was the famous last Habsburg, who was so understandably inbred that he couldn't produce any heirs. Um, and you can see both Philip and his niece slash wife at the Meadows on that green wall we saw earlier. Here we have her portrait um, with her fabulous hair and that giant ostrich feather. Um, but you can also see them in the background of Las Meninas, uh, which brings us back to where we started, to the career of Velazquez in 1623. As we saw, he made his break in the last month of Charles' visit, August 1623, same month um, that we saw that bullfight where they sat together on the balcony. Um, he painted a portrait of Philip that August, likely the Meadows portrait. Um, and as Pacheco mentioned, he painted a portrait of Charles too. The portrait has since been lost, but we don't have to just take Pacheco's word for it that it ever existed. As we know, Pacheco was so proud of his son-in-law that he might have been a little bit biased. Um, a reference to this portrait appears in the Prince's account books 
um, there's Pacheco, but a reference to the portrait appears in the prince's account books from his time in Spain. Um, and it's recorded as paid unto a painter for drawing the prince's picture signified by Mr. Porter from the prince. And that just means he, you know, signing off on the charge um, for 1100 reales. Um, and it's, let's see, little did they know in 1623 that the then unknown Velazquez, the 24 year old civilian upstart listed here as only a painter with a capital P would become one of the most painters, the most famous painters in history to rival even the coveted Titian. The portrait, as I said, does not survive, but one can imagine that perhaps it looked something like the one uh, painted at the Meadows. And I reckon, since, since that was painted at the same time, I reckon it may have even influenced the portrait he had painted upon his return that we see in, in detail here. There's something, there's some kind of affinity there between these two portraits. Um, and I would be curious, maybe you can write in the comment section if you agree or disagree about that. Um, so the bottom line here is I have a mission for all of you. If you ever are in England and you see kind of a suspiciously Velazquez looking painting of a mustachioed prince, no matter the price, snatch it up. I'll go in halvesies with you um, because stranger things have happened and you never know. Um, in the meantime, while you're um, social distancing, be safe like Philip and wear your mask and avoid crowds like we see here and in the Alcazar, all the, the painter and the Meninas have left the room. Um, if you want to read more about these events while you're cozied up at home, I have a few suggestions um, and you can see them here. Um, you can find most of these books at your local library, or if you want to order them, you can shop local and support the Wild Detectives um, by going through this link here. And I believe that Anne is feeding the, the, those links through the, um, and the list through the chat section. All of the books on the top row are available through that link. The two books on the bottom are um, out of print, but you can find them secondhand or at the library. Um, so thank you so much for listening and joining, and I'll hand it back over to Anne. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca. That was amazing. Um, I have in the chat function, I've uploaded a PDF that has all of these books and links, and I know that through Eventbrite, there was an email sent that also contains that. So now you have it in three forms. Um, so now we've reached the question and answer section. Um, we do have one question already, but um, I'd love to give everyone just a few moments to use the, the chat function to type any questions that you might have for Rebecca. Okay, go ahead and keep typing your questions, but we'll um, start addressing some of them. So the first one I'm going to address, which um, Todd is wondering if this is going to be uploaded, the recording of tonight's lecture will be uploaded. Um, at some point it will be, yes. <laughs> I'm going to let Rebecca review it and approve it. And so I would just keep an eye on um, the Meadows Museum YouTube page. That's where we're, we're putting all of it. Um, okay, so Rebecca, first question for you, and this comes from Helen. Um, did the late elder brother of Charles, Henry, also collect art? Okay, so Henry Frederick, great uh, English history um, crowd here. Yes, so he, for those of you who don't know, Charles was not actually supposed to be king. He had an older brother who died when he was, I think, 18 of typhoid fever. So he was, Charles was thrust into this role, um, having not been trained to become um, king, having not been thought he would be the heir to the throne. So Henry Frederick did have a collection of art. As a matter of fact, Anne of Denmark, the mother of Charles um, and Henry Frederick, who, by the way, I could just talk about this all day. She happened to also be a crypto Catholic, which was another reason why the Spanish thought that Charles might convert since his mother had secretly converted to Catholicism or not so secretly converted to Catholicism. Um, and Anne was a great collector, not anywhere near on the scale of Charles, what he became, but they, they were fond of collecting art, and Henry Frederick did have, um, have a collection of his own, and you can read more about Henry Frederick. There's a book called The Lost Prince, all about Henry Frederick, and I know for a fact it's at the Dallas Public Library because I've checked it out myself. Great question, thank you. Okay, so next question comes from Catherine. 
could you talk a little bit about how Charles's journey was viewed by the people um, in England? Uh, so it was not viewed that positively and he got a lot of flack when he got back because um, as I had mentioned, most Protestants in England were not very thrilled about this Catholic connection and um, until the war was declared um, on Spain, after he got back, there were a lot of worries that he was um, going to convert and kind of um, turn over to the other side. So the um, I, I'm not sure what the popular opinion was of the silliness of the journey in general, but I know that they weren't very excited that he had gone and they, they too saw it as a vote of confidence for the Catholic faction and that created a lot of turmoil back home. Right. Okay, this one comes from Joel. He's wondering if you could talk more about, and I'm hoping I'm, I'm getting this correctly, Joel, um, if you could talk more about the sources you use for your historical facts in this talk. Okay, um, well, most all of the sources are printed. I didn't go into any archives for this. Um, the Prince and the Infanta, this book that I've suggested the top left here, is your go-to stop it's it's got everything about the Spanish match. Um, all of the events of 1623 are recorded in excellent detail there, including appendices. If you want to read the specifics of um, any of the mechanics of this encounter, um, so I mainly relied on um, secondary sources that reprinted these primary sources. Of course. Um, the art of painting Pacheco's theory. I mean, I'm sitting at my desk so I could start pulling things out, but uh, I hope that answers your question. The primary sources came from secondary sources that are fairly well known. Okay, thank you. So we have a couple questions from Barbara. So I'm just gonna select one of them to start. Um, and it, it's to do with the fashion. So she's curious about why Charles was painted with a ruff instead of, and I apologize, I'm gonna mispronounce this, but instead of a gorilla? The gorilla? Yes. yes. Um, well, if you recall, um, fashion uh, enthusiasts, that when Philip IV came to the throne, he got rid of the Golia. It was actually made, uh, and this was um, part of the Count Duke of Olivares kind of austerity mission for Philip IV's reign. They, they saw all of this really flamboyant fashion that was so popular at the court of Philip III as a sign of decadence and as we see the uh, politics of the Spanish Empire in decline in this period, um, there was this push towards austerity. So the um, Golia collar, that huge collar, had actually been banned, but they had to lift all of this austerity when Charles arrived because they had to show off. Um, so, uh, but the, the balona, the, it's uh, V-A-L-O-N-A -A or Walloon, we say in English, collar, the more simple collar that we see in the Meadows portrait is what was de rigueur in Madrid in 1623. Okay, a second question off from Barbara. Um, Charles II, uh, he, did he travel to Spain and, and what were, what was, was that as disaster as that? No idea. I'm sorry. I, my uh, expertise ends uh, after the English Civil War. That's in the second half of the 17th century, and I'm, I'm not uh, well versed on that, but I would be happy to explore that with you. Um, and I think if it's the Barbara I'm thinking of, I'm sure she has uh, access to my email, so I would invite anyone to write me. Um, yes. Okay. So just a comment from, let's see, a comment from Donna, just thanking you for the, fan, the fascinating talk. And it sounds like she heard an extra, or she saw the Charles I King and Collector exhibit in 2018 at the Royal Academy. Um, and then we have someone curious about recommendations you might have for more entertaining summer reading. Yes, okay. So that's why I included a variety here. If you're looking for entertaining you, the academic books are entertaining, but potentially not in the level of entertainment you're looking for. I would recommend um, certainly, so the Vanishing Velazquez that I have here under nonfiction, if you wanna learn more about what happened to the portrait that disappeared, that's where you would go for that. Um, and then if you like historical fiction, I Am Venus or The Spanish Match. Now I haven't read either of those. 
Um, so I cannot tell you if they're good, but I would love it if you read them and told me if you think that they're good. But what I can endorse um, with flying colors is this graphic novel here that's been translated into English. It won the National Comic Prize in Spain in 2017 when it was published, and it's all about Las Meninas, um, but the career of Velazquez, and it's impeccably researched. Um, so I, and they sell it in the Prado gift shop. So if you want something that is very moving and um, very accurate, but also entertaining, I would go with a graphic novel. Okay, and then um, this is a question that comes from the audience, although it, it's a question that sounds like it would come from me. Um, are there any Netflix or kind of documentary television options? Anything you would recommend? About Velazquez? I, well, um, if you're familiar, there's a TV show in Spain, if you like watching Spanish TV, um, and it's got subtitles, and I think it's on Netflix, and it's called El Ministerio del Tiempo, the Ministry of Time, and it's about time travel ministry oh. in Spain. It's very fun, um, and there's, uh, Velazquez is a recurring character on that show. Um, and there's also an old movie from the 90s in Spain called El Rey Pasmado about um, when Velazquez paints the rugby Venus that you see here, the nude, um, and it's about the king and he sees it and he's like, he's never seen anything so uh, alluring. Um, so that would be, I, I don't know about a documentary. They should make a documentary about the vanishing Velazquez. Right, I think this will be our last question and hopefully bring us back a little bit towards your area of expertise, <laughs> although it's been great to get your recommendations for you know, books and TV. Um, so Andy is curious, um, the island that you discussed, is that also the setting for the marriage of uh, Maria Teresa and the famous French king? Yes, so that's it. So they exchanged um, brides, same thing. So she's the mother of Louis XIV. Um, that's what you saw in that picture, um, is the exchange of those brides. Yes. Great. Well, Rebecca, thank you. So very much. Um, it's been really delightful to get to spend this evening um, here with you, but with everyone uh, joining us tonight. And I do want to let everyone know that the museum has another program coming up in early July. Um, you can sign up to get a link to watch a movie at home. It's, it's by a company called Exhibition on Screen. And it's going to, it focuses on Picasso in his early years. And it looks at the three Picasso museums in Europe. And then um, following that, you can join us on July 9th for a talk by our curatorial assistant, Shelley uh, De Maria, where she'll be linking the film to the works in the Meadows Museum collection. So members can sign up for that now. Non-members, I believe tickets open on June 29th on our event bright page. So we do hope to see you all back um, for some more learning in the evening hours with the Meadows Museum. But Rebecca, thank you so very much um, for all your preparation and delivering such a, a beautiful lecture tonight. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Have a good night, everyone. Good night.